KCHW 102.7. Scott and Gene in the morning, 824 right now. Special guest in the studio. We were teasing this earlier. It's uh, Marie McCormick. Welcome to the studios, Marie. Hey. All right. How are you doing? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, if you were listening earlier, we told you Marie is a local author, and she's written a book. Uh, first, Marie, uh, how long have you uh, lived in Chuila? 14 years. 14 years. Yeah, wow. a couple of years in Cobble. You know, I pretty much run into everybody, but I hadn't, until uh, Jungle Jim brought you into the studios, uh, I hadn't met you before, so. Well, you know, you know I, I walk, if you see somebody with a bunch of odd-looking dogs, you know, like a weird sled dog team, <laughs> that's, that's you. Me. That's yeah. you. All right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. So your book is called Adventures in Underland. Um, is this a self-published book, or, or were you signed on with, with a company? Or um, Well, I, I signed on with Page Publishing, which is self-publishing type thing, okay. you know, kind yeah. of a uh, hybrid. <laughs> it, it's a really nice-looking book. Oh, mm-hmm. so thanks. so yeah. I mean, it is. It's a nice looking book, and yeah. and now uh, we're going to talk about this. But uh, after uh, this morning's show, you're going to be at Paul's. Is that uh, correct? Yep, I'll be at Paul's from nine to two, and have my crate of books, and probably in a corner somewhere. And so, okay. if anyone wants to see the book and talk to me, and you know, get an autographed copy. You know, maybe I'll be famous, maybe not. I don't know. But <laughs> right. will you adjust her microphone a oh, little bit? Yeah. Get her a little closer there. All right, I'm going to read uh, off the back of your book, and then we'll, I'm going to ask you some questions. Um, we, me, I got to talk to Marie last week, and uh, a very interesting life story. Now, this is an autobiography, correct? Mm-hmm. Okay, it says, The girl has spent the first part of her childhood with two loving but unstable parents. The inevitable happens all at once, and the girl spends the rest of her childhood in her mom's old Brooklyn neighborhood that's in the middle of a mafia power struggle. The girl makes friends with kids in situations as bad as or more disturbing than hers it's a historical novel that chronicles the events that have led to the present state of affairs in the inner cities so uh, autobiography tell us a little bit of uh, what gave you the desire to write a book on your your childhood experience and some of them that you were telling me kind of dark that when we were talking and stuff what prompted you to to write a book on this um well i had uh you know i was in a kind of a depression uh, around 2008 and you know I started just writing some stuff that was happening to me at the time and then I started like segueing into past stuff and then I just kind of kept going with it until I had like about four or five notebooks <laughs> full you know and so I said well let me see if I could put this in some kind of order because when I've told people about my past they always say the same thing you should write it down you should write a book and you know so after 25 years or so I finally listened to them (laughs) now was it was it something that you found to be very therapeutic you know um yeah it was therapeutic but at the same time it was really tough because when I'd get into some of the really low or dark points, you know, part of my mind would be stuck there until I wrote my way out of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I had to do it in small bites. I found if I did it in too large a, b- a bite, even my husband, you know, he'd just take one look at me and says, you've been writing all day, haven't you? And I'm like, <laughs> so I, I started doing it in smaller bites, which is why it took so long to um, get published. <laughs> And that's why that's when you have the like the Einstein look and your hair's all on end and you're frazzled from writing for eight hours, right? <laughs> just just the <a laughs> weird look on my face, you know, because I, I would it's weird when you start chronicling about your past. It's almost like time travel. Mm-hmm. When you really get into it, you can you're like there. You remember how it smells, how, uh, you know, the muggy heat feels, you know, you remember all kinds of little details you forgot. And so it's basically dragging yourself through an emotional roller coaster, reliving the past. Yeah, I describe it as it putting down. cigarettes out of my own arm. Ow! <laughs> yeah. Ow! Ow! Yeah. All right, so so kind of kind of set us up and, and give us a glimpse of your childhood that you show in the book. Um. Okay. Well, Dad died, uh, drank himself to death on a park bench. Um, and later, you know, I wasn't allowed to tell anybody in the family anything. You know, I, the only thing I was told was, t- tell them your dad's a mechanic. And I at first, I didn't know what that was, but I said it. And if they pressed me for more information, I kind of, like, skedaddled out of the room or something. And uh, then, 
later on, um, I wound up in the system. Then my mom wound up in a psych ward uh, in my early teens. So coming out of that. Uh, Does that mean you ended up in like foster homes, that type of stuff? Group homes and some psych wards. Okay. Uh, I didn't like being in the group home, and I started cutting. And, you know, today they know the difference between cutting and real suicide attempts, but back then they didn't. Mm -hmm. So they had a – the director was on vacation, and they had a vacationing director in the group home I was in, and so they sent me to psych. And it's – I did get in one group home where I should have stayed, you know, and it probably would have been better off, but – My mom kept saying, oh, you don't belong here, you don't belong here. So, you know, I wound up getting myself kicked out of there and went through a cycle. And one of the psych wards was really a horrible, horrible place. And the kids I was in with had been in the system since childhood. They all talked fondly about Elmhurst Hospital, Children's Hospital, where they had been, you know, little kids five six years old they were foster kids that uh they just you know got tossed around so much they became agitated i mean they labeled everybody paranoid schizophrenic but i didn't really see anybody have any they asked you every time are you hearing voices are you hearing voices it became like stockholm syndrome after a while because I'd say no, 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 and they'd still keep me there. So one day I said yes, and that, that didn't get me out either. So, <laughs> <laughs> so now you were you were telling me then you moved in with a, a family relative. No, um, well, you know when we left Staten Island, uh, we couldn't find a place that my mom would accept. So we wound up living with my grandparents for nine months, and my grandma. Every one of the grandchildren used the B word on her, (laughs) and uh, she was angry at my mom, and so she would snipe at me all day, and I wasn't in the mood at that point. You know, I lost my dad and my home and my school and my friends, and so, you know, I always went head-to-head with her. So tell, tell us what it was like as a kid. Growing up, some of the stories you were telling me when you were in the studio about being on the in on the streets and as a child in a, a neighborhood controlled by the mafia, what was that like? Well, my mom was uh, the other woman that, and uh, she was dating our mobster landlord. So I got to overhear a lot about what was going on, how the politics ran, who was playing protection, and uh, when. The one uh, in Genevieve's crime family, I believe, and when the uncle died, that's when uh, Carmine Galente started rising up. He had done 30 years in prison. He's infamous, especially in the East Coast, because he's the one, I mean, the neighborhood was Italian, and, you know, it's like, oh, discrimination in housing, you get fined for maybe two grand, but... If you rented to the wrong color or the wrong ethnic group, then you got your house burned down or your kneecaps broke. So he allowed the neighborhood. He said, okay, fine, we'll let all the Hispanics in. And then they flooded it with drugs. The uh, Italian mob flooded it with drugs. And they were selling it out of every bodega. And it just, like, overnight, from the time I went into the psych ward to the time I came out was 15 months, you know, in the group homes and everything. And it just, like, changed completely. Um, You know, I mean, there was plenty of kids to hang out with. And, you know, know, I met one girl that she had been kidnapped with her sister when she was a little kid and then sent back – and she had never gone to school, you know, so never seen a counselor, never had any of those things. And that, you know, so these were the lives of some of my friends. And so now you got this guy pouring drugs into the neighborhood. So they're, you know, everybody's, you know, getting high and doing whatever they can. And I found out later, like people from the tri-state area knew about the park two blocks from me, you know, (laughs) to come there and score. And in the 90s, uh, there was a big shopping area called Knickerbocker Avenue. And it was called by the police the well because it was like an endless well of drugs. Um, 
and Carmine Galente wound up being uh, assassinated in the back of this restaurant that never had any people in it, just the two uh, people that owned it. They looked like uh, <laughs> they always sat outside in the summer, and they, they reminded me of an Italian-American Gothic and uh, because the wife was always standing behind the husband with the, her hand on his shoulder. And uh, so one day, Carmine Galente actually made me a lemonade. I went to the bodega to get some weed, and uh, I was about maybe, I don't remember when he got shot, but I was maybe about 16 or so, I think. And uh, I went in, the the bodega was closed, because every once in a while someone wouldn't pay somebody, and the cops would make a sweep, and they'd all be out by nighttime, you know. (laughs) And... uh, But the store was closed, so I went next door because it was a hot day, and I asked for a soda, and he's telling me in broken English, you know, the soda coolers were broken, and he didn't know how to make a milkshake. He said, my cousin, my cousin's, uh, because it was his cousin's place. And so he made me a tap water lemonade the way my mom would with the lemon juice and the sugar and the water. (laughs) But he didn't charge me for it and said to go. And then, you know, short time later, I see him, you know, he reminded me of a cartoon bulldog because he always had the stub of a cigar in his uh, (laughs) mouth. And uh, then they showed him dead out in the, they killed him in in the backyard of the place. Wow. Yeah. Now you told me one place you used to frequent too is is uh, they had a game room. It was one of the mob mm-hmm. stores. They had a game room in the front so they could have kids as protection. Well, yeah, you know, partly that, and partly you know, with a uh, you know, the neighborhood, you know, with it, especially with Italian, because uh, in Italy it's like that too, where the neighborhood kind of looks out for the kids. But we wore protection because, like, they had a nice wall uh, right next to a plate glass window. And we used to play handball, and the ball would hit the window all the time. Uh, One time a kid went to move the dumpster to get the ball, and the dumpster rolled and bashed in one of their cars. And they never chased us away. (laughs) You know, they would come out and say, hey, hey, be careful, but they wouldn't chase us away. A lot less chance of a drive-by if there's a bunch of kids in front of the building kind of thing. Right. And inside the building, in the front, I mean, now these guys aren't, these are working guys. The grocery store across the street, you know, and when I was researching the book, I didn't even know these guys were capos. You know, I knew they were associated with the mob, but I didn't know how high up they were. And uh, so they had the cafe in the front with the plate glass windows, and they had gelato and cappuccino. And it was open, you know, early in the morning to late into the night. And then in the middle room, they had the games for us. They had the pool table, foosball, pinball. And then in the very back room, they had high-stakes gambling. You know, a couple (laughs) times I'd seen the door open, and you could see hundreds on the table, you know, probably like thousands of dollars by (laughs) each guy. And so we were playing in there, you know, we're drinking our little cappuccinos, and this is the real stuff, not, you know, it was <laughs> like a shot of espresso, you know, and a little tiny bit of milk. So we were all sugared and caffeined up and <laughs> playing. Nice. But they looked out for us, you know. The one place where I never had anybody hit on me as a kid was that place. Right. You know, they they were good to us um, if I wore something too skimpy uh, Joe Licata, who, you know, I, I mentioned the real names of the guys that made the news. Everybody else, I changed the names. Okay. <laughs> but Joe Licata, it was the Licata Brothers had the place, and, you know, he would tell my mom, he t- he's the one who told my mom to get me a training bra when I was like 11 because <laughs> I was playing handball, and I guess I was disturbing the men in the cafe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow, wow. Yeah. So a, a rough but very uh, interesting childhood. Yeah. yeah, you know, it and was... what I've noticed as as you've been telling us your story, uh, your Brooklyn accent is coming back more and more and more. So, Oh, you should hear it when I'm mad. <laughs> <laughs> Make her mad, Jean. Okay. No. No, no when, I, when I'm hearing all the, the connections that she's had in her lifetime, I'm not going to make her mad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely <laughs> makes for an interesting book. Now, you uh, picked out a selection, and she, ha- she said she, ha- she had to look for one that was family-friendly. Yeah, uh, (laughs) kind of hard. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, this is Marie Marie McCormick from her book, Adventures in Underland. Did I say that right? Yes. All right. Uh, Read us your passage. Okay. Family court ruled that I be put in a group home. It wasn't much of a hearing. I was my court-appointed attorney's first case. 
I wanted to be put in a group home. I wanted to be on my own. It seemed romantic to be an orphan. I didn't have it bad at home. I didn't appreciate what I had. I had fantasized about being away from my mother since I was little, before the boyfriends, the separation, the move. Was it just because she slapped me, said real mean things? She was good to me otherwise. Was I just the unhappy, recalcitrant brat that Parisi and my extended family thought I was? They arranged for me to go to Gell House on Staten Island. It was just after New Year's, and I was given a few days to get things together. The night before I left, it snowed. I went with Brenda and Teresa to a nearby parking lot out of an abandoned factory. Sometimes older kids and street gangs hung out at the factory, but tonight it was just us. The snow was perfect, and we spent hours building a snowman. It was the last little kid thing I would do with my friends. When I put some bottle cap buttons on our creation, the snow turned orange. I looked at my hands and saw my fingers had broken through my gloves, and my fingertips had split open and bled. I showed my friends, and we all got quiet. They said a casual goodbye to me like I wasn't leaving tomorrow. We all headed in the same direction, each in our own thoughts. Mom got mad at me when she saw my fingers. She soaked them in warm water. Man, they hurt when the feelings started returning. I arrived at Gella House with Mom and Parisi and split fingers on both hands. I got what I wanted. Wow. Mm -hmm. All right. So now you are going to be at Paul's yes. Coffee House mm -hmm. uh, beginning at uh, 9 o'clock, yes. roughly there. All right. Um, tell us uh, how long has the book been out? Uh, it's been out about four months now. Okay. And where can people purchase the book? Um, online, it's all over the place. That's a nice thing with page publishing. You know, I'm not sure. You know, you got to do ISBN numbers and e-books and things like that. So they got it on Kindle. They got uh, – so you could get e-books. They got it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, Bargain Books, and uh, – the list price goes anywhere from like ten ninety five to fifteen ninety five online. For me, I'm doing it twelve ninety five because I had to, you know, you don't really make much profit because what I, the way the contract works is if they sell it, they take a cut. But if I just buy the books wholesale and sell them myself, I get the profit. But by the time you figure in shipping and everything, it's pretty tight. <laughs> I bet. I bet. And I bet you it's not cheap to, to have a book like that produced. <laughs> no. No. But uh, actually, the thing, too, is I did the cover myself. Um, so you did the cover art, and that probably helped on the expense as well? Well, no. It, it came with the package, but uh, I wanted to, you know, do it... I, I put myself on there, but I tried to make myself unrecognizable, except for the hair. The hair is about the same. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm one of the few people with this kind of hair in Chuila. That's another way to recognize okay. me. <laughs> and then, you know, I kind of go shades of the past. I put, you know, old, you know, because it's about generations of my family in Brooklyn. You know, it goes through. Um, I don't go, like, way back or anything, but I give a brief uh, you know, uh, talk about my mom growing up and my dad, what happened with my dad and stuff. So, uh, yeah, I, I Photoshopped the book. I got a nice Photoshop program. All right. So. All right. And, and if you want to search it online, it's N. Marie McCormick. Yes. All right. And Adventures in Underland. All right. Or you could do better than that and swing by Paul's this morning and uh, visit with Marie, have uh, a cup of coffee, and uh, get an autographed copy of the book, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything you want to add, Marie? Um, well, part, you know, when you asked me what the reason was I did this, over, you know, since I've moved out here uh, in Stevens County, I've had jobs where I'm driving people to medical appointments. And uh, I get, and I drove for CPS for a while, and and I always related good to the kids, especially foster children, because I had been there, and, you know, they liked talking to me, and they were real open, and I advise them, you know, just... Pretty much I did all the mistakes, and so I'm telling them what not to do. And uh, <laughs> and it it really seemed to help them. And so 
I'm kind of I'm on disability and I'm taking care of my husband right now and so I I wanted the book it, it's an R-rated book for kids that had R-rated lives or adults of you know that had R-rated childhoods and uh it, it's kind of putting everything down in the book and trying to get it distributed I mean anyone could read it but my target audience is like young adults or maybe kids that are just starting to age out of the foster care si- system because it's scary, you know. Now, And there's also worse things sometimes than being in foster care. Sometimes they send you home, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <So. laughs> that's, the, that's the hard part, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. All right, again, Marie McCormick, you can catch her at Paul's beginning at 9 o'clock. Thank you so much for coming in this morning and uh, sharing uh, um, some of your, your – your, your most personal parts of your life, really. So, <laughs> thank and, you. and it's all in book form, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, guys. Yeah, now it's like, oh, yeah, everybody gets to see everything, you know, and it's like I live in a little town. I don't know. <laughs> so, so you can, Was this a good idea? <laughs> yeah. So you can literally say my life is an open book. Yes. There you go. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Once again, Marie McCormick, Adventures in Underline Catcher at Paul's here at 9 o'clock. This is KCHW 102.7. We're going to jump back into the music, and me and Gene will be right back. Stay here looking right now, 845 KCHW 102.7.